What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of the Post Game Podcast. I'm here with Corey Smith. I am here with Michael Clark, football analyst for Back Pride. Michael, uh, first of all, how are you doing, sir? Ooh, I've been better. Yeah. Uh, we spent a Saturday night watching that abysmal offensive performance, uh, one of the worst offensive performances I have seen at any level. Uh, it was uh, horrific. Yeah, which is, you know, uh, we're coming off of saying you, you said the, almost the exact same thing two weeks ago. Uh, mm, no, this was Louisville loss. So this was worse. I mean, I think it was worse. Yeah. I mean, you know, the one the one thing I will say coming out of this one, um, usually there's something where we're like, all right, you know, the offense struggled, but the defense was good or, you know, the offense struggled. But, you know, these couple guys really got going. I mean, tonight it was just a you know, anything that they got going offensively. What seemed forced, um, Kevin Concepcion, you know, running the football, catching the football on short yardage passes, trying to get things going. Um, you got Anthony Smith out there that uh, we haven't seen all season long. Had nine snaps prior to this week and uh, didn't catch either one of his passes. You got, by my count, six or seven drop passes in this game. Granted, some of them were, you know, plays that were contested, but that's on your receiver for not getting open, not getting any kind of separation. Um, so there's there's a lot of things that need to be fixed on the offensive side of the football, and the defense continues to. You know, I, I wrote into my post game takeaways. You know, the the thing about the defense is we keep saying every single week. Well, you know, if you take away some of the explosive plays, they they played a pretty good game overall. Well, the issue is you gave up two really explosive plays one a 69 yard touchdown the other an 80 yard touchdown and you lost 24 to 3 mostly because of that so th there's there's got to be some give and take there there's got to be you know the defense has got to be more sound uh in their gaps in their you know they're tackling everything um so anyways Let's uh, let's jump into this thing um, <laughs> before we get things started. As always, I want to remind people to uh, you know visit our iTunes, Google Play Store, give us a rating if you enjoy the podcast. Typically, we're a little more upbeat than this. Uh, help get the word out there to the rest of Wolfpack Nation. Also, if you are watching this on YouTube, please make sure to like and subscribe. We will you'll be able to get some notifications every time we jump on this. Whether it's positive, negative, there will be some positive ones in the future. Uh, whether it's this sport or basketball or baseball or something along those lines, we'll be talking about some positive things in the future. Uh, make sure to check out all of Pack Pride's coverage as well throughout the football and basketball offseason for $1 for the first month or get 30% off for one year of Pack Pride and the entire 24-7 sports network. So head over to packpride.com to find out more about becoming a premium subscriber. All right. So let's start. I mean, let's start with this offense. Because the offensive side of the football, as much as we talked about them last week, you know, scoring 48 points against Marshall, uh, doing a little bit of everything right, whether it was running game or or the passing game tonight against Duke, next to nothing went right outside of, you know, a miraculous 57 yarder, 57 yard field goal on the opening drive that came on four plays and zero yards gain total for the offense. Um, that's it. That's that was your offense. Outside of that, you had. Uh, I believe it was seven uh, or six punts, three turnovers on downs, and a, an interception that led to an eight-yard touchdown pass uh, as the only play on the drive. So, uh, you know, offensively, where do we start here? Ooh, uh, it was just bad all the way around. I'm, I'm looking at, you know, working on my post-game takeaways day after it goes right now. And, uh, yeah, I just don't think State just wasn't ready to play uh, from the – you know, start outplayed, out coached, out executed. I mean, we can go down the list. I think the most troubling thing to me, Corey, and I, I'm sitting here really, you're analyzing this game, and I, you, we're both going to rewatch it. Yeah. If these teams played 10 times, I think Duke would beat NC State 10 times. They were, they are significantly better. They did this tonight, dominated them uh, with a backup quarterback. I mean, you put, you insert one of the best quarterbacks in the country in this game, and it could be really ugly. I mean, because they're, they're going to score more than 24 points. I mean, a guy only completed four passes. But like you said, two of them were for touchdowns. I, I just yeah. think everybody's quick to well, blame the coaches. And, and one, they of just, one of those touchdowns, like I said, was an eight-yard pass. Yeah, sure. That, <laughs> you know, so we'll talk yeah. about the defense in a little while. But Robert and I deserves 
a significant share of blame. There's no question. Dave yep. Dorn as well. But I think if we're if you're being objective and you're looking at this football team, they are so far behind the eight ball when it comes to the skill players. I mean, they just outside of Kevin Conception, I wrote this. Is there one receiver on this roster that would start anywhere else in the ACC? Probably not. If we're being brutally honest, you've got one receiver. I can't really figure out what is going on at running back. Michael Allentine only gets five carries. Is Kevin Conception your best running back, too? It is a major problem. The offensive line is is bad. It's not good. I, I don't know going forward, and if I'm if I'm crazy, just say I am going into the offseason, regardless of what happens these final five games, the receiver room needs to be completely revamped. Completely. I mean, there's not a lot other than Kevin Conception, that's it. We've got enough to say now. Seven games is a big enough sample size. We're ha- more than halfway through the season. It's not getting better. It is what it is, and the offensive line has been incredibly disappointing. Injuries aside, even when the guys are healthy, they're just not good. And I know we're going to talk about MJ Morris. He was not particularly good tonight either. But I don't know who you could insert at quarterback and expect them to play well against high-level competition. No disrespect to Marshall. I think they're a good football team. When you're going to turn around and play teams like Duke, who's a very good team, Miami, North Carolina, I mean, State's just not going to be any match for those teams personnel-wise. I mean, they just, they're just they just not. Whether it's you missed on your evals at receiver, you just haven't developed depth or developed guys, whatever, at offensive line. And – if we're being 100% honest, I'm more worried about MJ Morris's health the rest of the season. There's no way he's going to make it through the next five games if they don't protect him better, mm-hmm. give him time. And you can tell he is frustrated. And, again, he did not play well. And But this is one of those situations where I, I, I literally, and if I'm off base, you tell me, how much blame can you put on him? Yeah. He has nobody who can create separation outside Kevin Conception. His I mean, he has one, line, he's – He's had two actually bad passes in the past two weeks, and both of them did lead to interceptions. But really, outside of that, I mean, I can't, I can't count the number of times that he hit guys on the numbers tonight, especially early on in the game, uh, hit guys on the numbers, and they drop passes. Like I said, some of them being contested, but again, that's on the receivers for not getting any kind of separation against Duke's DBs. This that's is the ACC. Yeah, you gotta exactly. make plays. Yeah, you can't – there's no excuses for that. I mean, the only guy that you have that's, again, making an impact in this game truly, you know, on a a, you know play-by-play basis is Kevin Concepcion right now. And that's – I mean, and and he's having to do just about all of it because he had nearly 100 yards tonight. Outside of that, Keon Lassane, six grabs for 25 total yards. Uh, Bradley Rosner, three grabs for 33 yards. I'm pretty sure he dropped his other two targets that he had. Um, Kendra Graffiel had some, you know, a couple catches late, but they were against soft coverage. Uh, you know, Terrell Timmons, I thought he made some good catches tonight, but he made two total catches. Like that's, you've got to be able to, uh, you've got to be able to make these catches, make these plays. Um, and, and, you know, and it's, there's, there's no, it's no more evident than playing against a Duke team that is in its second year under Mike Elko, that is more fundamentally sound more complete and playing a better game even with a backup quarterback like we've we've talked all year about how you know duke is great because of riley leonard they're they're this you know this this amazing team because of riley leonard and and your ground game jordan waters you know i mean (laughs) jordan waters had 13 carries for 123 yards and that's solely because one of those carries is for 83 yards you're limited to 50 yards outside of that you can't do those types of things this is this is not a team that's playing fundamentally sound football. And that's what, what Dave Dorn is preaching week in and week out is we've got to play fundamentally sound football and it's just not being accomplished uh, by this team. So I, I agree with you. I think there needs to be a hard reset after this season. Um, and whether that's, <laughs> whether that's with the coaching staff or it's with the players, there's, there's gotta be something that, that happens here that, that shakes, shakes things up. I don't know if you saw the graphic on TV. They pulled up Duke's additions via the transfer portal in the offseason. And I really think NC State needs to adopt a similar thing. It was almost double-digit guys. They had a lot of them on the defensive side of the ball. I would argue State needs to do that offensively. I mean, this is um, 
this is big time college football. We don't have time to sit around and develop people and, and hope for the best at this point. You know pretty quickly if guys can play or they can't. Right now, unfortunately, you've got a bunch of guys who've been there three, four, five years who can't play. And it's brutal. That's a brutal comment. And you know, I just it's every week. It's the same people who are not making plays, but they continue to get snaps. I wrote this in my takeaways. You know, you're probably not going to beat Miami, North Carolina, any of these teams. Play the young t- play the young guys. Mm-hmm. You need to play them. Figure out what you got in the future because I think you got to be super active in the transfer portal. You're going to have to have a lot, lot of hard conversations with guys who've been in the program for multiple years after this season because, just to be honest, they haven't developed. And, again, is that on the coaches? Sure, yes, yeah, some of that is. But I, I don't know offensively right now if Robert and I could – have the best game plan of all time and it lead to sustain sustained success against good opponents um i against acc level top five or six teams in the league i don't think there's just not enough there and i think that is obvious yeah i'm gonna say this and i'm gonna leave it alone because we need to get back to looking at this game overall but you know the issue that you have if you're if you're playing the older players that aren't making plays those players are eventually going to transfer to try to look for somewhere else to go where they can make plays, whether it's at a lower level or not. If you're not playing the guys that you feel could potentially be making plays or could be learning and progressing right now, they're going to also look for greener pastures because they're going to go, well, I'm going to go to a place where I can play. So you can't, I mean, that's, that's the issue you're running into right now is you've got, I agree with you completely. I think you do have to go to younger players, guys that can, that can be making plays and guys that are, you know, and I said this in my post game takeaways afterwards. Like right now, all NC State is playing for, and we're talking about this seven games into the season. You win this game today, you find a way to to win this game. We're talking about a completely different narrative here right now. But they're four and three. They're one and two in the ACC going into the bye. You've got five games left on the schedule right now. You're playing for pride, and it sounds weird to say that this early on in the season, but you, I mean. Your ten, any chance at a 10 win season is almost out the window if you lose one of these last five or six games if you do make it to a bowl game. You, I mean, you're you're not playing for an ACC championship berth right now. You're not playing for um, you're not playing to be able to, you know, truly <laughs> put yourself into a you know discussion for a, a tier one bowl game at this point. And and like eight win seasons are not, you know, something that people are gonna want to talk about or, or care about at this point. So you're playing for pride. And I think, again, like you said, I think maybe a a reset needs to happen somehow uh, during this bye week where you go, all right, here's here's what we're going to do. We're going to move forward with the younger guys, you know, for better or for worse. But we've got to be able to play with the guys that we know we're going to have on the roster for the next several years and figure the system out with them now, which is, you know, while 2019 was a debacle of a season, they spent a lot of that time playing younger players and getting better for the 2020, 2021, and 2022 seasons. Yeah, and I think you're just in a really tough spot. Um, mm-hmm. Really a no-win situation right now because you're really offensively not good anywhere outside of, as we say, Kevin Conception is a you know the lone really bright spot right now. And I still think MJ Morris is going to be a good quarterback for NC State. I just think – and going back to Brandon Armstrong, I think it really – he did not play particularly well, but I think this further amplifies the issues that are throughout this yeah. offense. You just don't have – you don't have the horsepower at all. There's not it, – it, 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 it is crazy to think about having to move Kevin Conception to running back because you don't have enough there and you don't have enough at receivers. He's having to do both. At a Power Five program that has, you know, been consistently a solid program under Dave Dorn in week in, you know, year eleven, that's that's kind of inexcusable, um, yeah. in my opinion. And I know nobody feels worse about it than the coaches, but you know, if you went into the off season looking back hindsight twenty twenty, how are you not more aggressive in the transfer portal when it came to offensive skill players? I mean, we're past, but we don't want to make this guy mad. He could leave. Who cares? I mean, like, who cares? You can't play for the future or I want to make this guy feel good. Like, there is just – you know if we see it, they see it times 10. There's not anything there. I I think Robert and I is a good football coach. I think Dave Dorn's a pretty good football coach. I just – I don't know right now what you could do coach-wise to help this offense. 
you can't block anybody consistently. You can't pass for text. You can't get a push in the run game. You don't have a lot. The receiver issue, I think, is the most glaring simply because it is such an important position in college football and NFL, any level. Mm -hmm. You can't compete if you don't have players on the outside. And NC State, I would argue, Corey, is fortunate to be 4-3 and three right now considering what they have at the receiver position. Is this the worst receiving core they've had maybe ever? It's, I mean, I don't know. That, three, that 19 team that we covered was not a lot of fun. It was a 20, whenever it was. But I, I didn't feel like they were this limited. I mean, it is, it is yeah. staggering how bad they are at receiver. Well, and the, I mean, and the thing too is it's it's just one thing after the other with this team as well. Because I mean, we were talking about it. You know, we were talking about the wide receivers dropping passes. Well, then you, know, you have Delver Mims out there that drops a pass too, and it's like, and then how is he getting the same amount of touches as Michael Allen? I mean, on what? Yeah, play? I mean, and this that's that's, that's, that's one thing that I wrote about post game takeaways too. Was like, you know, it, you can say whatever you want to about the ground game. You can get upset about the ground game, but. You've got I – mean, it's it's hard to get upset with a ground game when nobody – no running back has over five carries in a game. I know they're playing catch-up, but, like, uh, you know, the first half they weren't playing a ton of catch-up. You were down by two scores. You could have still ran the football uh, more than – you know, more than a total of ten times outside of MJ Morris running for his life at times. So, it's just – it's, it's – it, again, it comes down to so many things that it's hard to put it all in one – all in, you know – in one summation here, but you know, penalties killed NC State early and continue to kill them on some drives. Uh, you know, drop passes definitely killed NC State in the first half, and then there was a couple in the second half too that you know killed any sort of drive. Uh, in particular, you know, <laughs> I didn't agree with the play call in general. You had a fourth and three, and you try to throw it 50 yards down the field, but it's a catchable ball for, for Anthony Smith. He goes down to the ground and, and loses the football. That is a play that you make that play. It may be too little too late, but you get yourself, at least in the discussion, you get yourself out. You know, you, you have yourself in a, in a chance to score a touchdown. You have to make that catch. Have, mean, yeah, a chance there's a reason he has three points. Yeah, he had, he had nine snaps yeah. going to this game. And I don't know if other people, media outs will say it. There's a reason Anthony Smith's not playing. And that's yeah. why he can't consistently catch the football. He's not alone. The whole room outside Kevin Conception seems to struggle to consistently bring the ball in. And in the ACC, Division One, Power Five, you, that is is not acceptable. It is it, yeah. you've got to make plays in the passing game. MJ Morris, I mean, he, again, he was far from perfect, but I mean, I can't imagine how frustrated he is. He's back there getting absolutely killed, and then on top of it, when he does get the ball to the receivers, um, you know, seems like 70 percent of the time it's being dropped, or somebody's not running the right route. It goes without saying the group. Uh, outside conception can can not consistently create separation. That is a, a major problem. It's just there are so many issues in that receiver room, and all of them are significant. So I, I don't know what else. Um, and there's no really light at the end of the tunnel for the group. I mean, you've got guys who've been here three, four, or five years, and and they're still getting the line share of the snaps, and I just can't understand it. Um, I, I just can't. And you're forcing the ball to them every week and it never works and here we are we're still doing it we're still doing it i i, I just I, I just kind of at a loss i really don't know i, I don't know <laughs> just and i'll i'll finish up the offensive discussion here by chris's comment he said y'all are being too negative we did get into the red zone at least one time that's we stand corrected yeah, you're right. You're right. And then they immediately got sacked. I believe it was uh, MJ Morris immediately got sacked and lost several yards to get outside of the 20. And and they failed to, they failed to get uh, in the end zone on that drive, as you can imagine, in a, a 24-3 loss. Um, all right. You know, I want to go over to the defensive side of the football. You know, it's it's one of those things where normally we, we take this time to discuss, you know, Peyton Wilson – but, you know, 11 tackles for him, two tackles for loss, one QB hurry. Yeah, that, those sound great. But he also over-pursued a couple times. He missed his own gaps. So, uh, you know, and I will say this. He said after the game, you know, he's he's had some post-game comments over the last several weeks, and and rightfully so. And he even said after this game today, uh, he the first thing that he said when he got up to the mic was, I just want to apologize to Wolfpack Nation. Y'all, I mean, y'all deserve better than that. And, and I will say this to, to NC State fans, like, 
this stadium was at least, I mean, I would say over 50%. Oh, of course. Fans. And, 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 and I'm saying that as it was over 50% because it wasn't completely full. Uh, and, and NC state fans took up, I mean, uh, the entire end zone over here. Uh, I mean, they were right against the end zone over here. So if this was a close game, the fans might have actually had a little bit of say so in it. But instead, you're down 17 to three at the half, and you end up losing a 20 a game 24 to three in a game where outside of the first drive in which you kicked one field goal on a four play zero yard drive, you did absolutely nothing. So defensively, Michael, your your thoughts? Well, I think we can an- overanalyze Peyton Wilson to the umpteenth degree, but. I mean, he's, he's getting his all every he's single still, play. So, yeah. He's still far and away the only bright spot tonight, in my opinion, just because of I mean, he made a couple touchdown saving plays. He's just playing so hard. It, it, it's still, to me, is hard to be overly critical of the defense because I think at this point it is obvious that they are pressing and yeah. the big plays that they are giving up. I'm not making excuses for them. A big part of those big plays are – they're just trying so hard. They know, Corey, to be competitive and have a chance to win, they have to generate turnovers or score themselves. So what do you do there? You're swinging for the knockout. You're trying to do this. You're over-pursuing. You're doing this, that. And there's so much pressure on that group right now. That eight-yard touchdown pass, that's not on them. I mean, let's be realistic. They, okay, so they said they gave up 17 points. That's more than enough to win. You should. That's enough. We can't sit there – and and beat on them too much. And half of Duke's offense came on two plays. And unfortunately, like you said, they're touchdowns. But you're getting absolutely nothing out of the offense and regressing back to them to have four false start penalties in the first quarter with no crowd noise is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, that is inexcusable. You get a tripping call. And then what, Anthony Belt doesn't line up correctly? I mean, what is he, a, a red shirt junior? And he doesn't, I mean, how can you do that? You're yeah. second and five, and you don't line up correctly. You would have been third and one. Instead, you're penalized, drop back even worse. But the problem you have there, they always talk about competitive depth. There is none. So if a guy makes a mistake or two or three mistakes, you don't have anybody else you can put in the game. So state's behind the eight ball there. And whether it's development, depth, offense, however you want to categorize it, you're in a tough spot because guys – who make plays like that, you make a mistake like that, you need to go sit. If you don't line up correctly, you need to go sit. And I think that that is a massive problem right now. You don't have any depth in the receiver room. You don't have any depth in the offensive line room. So when guys play bad or play poorly, you can't substitute in for them. And I think that's an understated, under-discussed part of this. There's no competitive depth in the receiver or offensive line room. So you don't have any way to, uh, I guess, get guys' attention. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. I mean, and I will say, you know, that's the thing about, I agree with you on the defense. I mean, it's, you know, I think we, we say that every single week solely because of the fact that we know how much weight is on this defense. I mean, and it, and, and it goes all the way back to last year. I mean, even before all the QB changes, like you think back to the ECU game, like that, that ECU team was a good team, but not, not a team that, that you should have struggled with that hard and the offense couldn't get anything going. I mean, it goes, it's, it's been this way for so long for this defense that every single one of them are pressing every single play. Um, and, and, you know, granted, like that's, that's why it's crazy that they were only held them. You know, they only got three touchdowns. Yeah. This game. Um, and, and again, one of those touchdowns on an eight play drive, I mean, eight, eight yards yard one play. So yeah. it's just, I mean, I don't know. Like, I, I got frustrated with the defense tonight watching and, and seeing those types of plays just because I know each and every single week how much they talk about. We've got to be more disciplined. We've got to – we can't allow those big gap plays to happen. And, you know, and and and, and that's taking away – like, one thing I think we're forgetting is, you know, there was two different times where they had them backed up on both end zones. One, end, one on this end zone over here, another one on this end zone over here. And, and multiple – both times – they were driven back all the way into basically the one yard line because of their own penalties. And then NC state allowed them to bail themselves out on long runs, one by the quarterback, Henry Bielen and another by uh, Jordan waters, I believe it was. And, you know, 
you you make those plays, you potentially get a safety there. That's a game changing play. So as as much as I feel for the defense, you've got to make those plays to be able to kind of generate that spark. We keep hearing so much over the last week, like the offense needs to generate a spark. The offense needs to generate a spark. To be honest, the spark for this team in games that they've won and close games that they've won has consistently come from the defense, whether it's been an interception yeah. oh, 100%. Or, or a turnover that's led to a short drive for, for the offense to be able to put something together. Like that's where the, that's where the spark comes from this team. And, and mm-hmm. without that right now, um, and again, that's a lot of pressure on the defense without that they're, they're not winning football games. I tell you what, though, sitting here and we're doing this podcast, I feel really bad that Peyton Wilson has to go up to the mic and say something like that. Yeah. A guy who is just playing his his tail off for NC State, yeah. for him to be that unselfish. I mean, he's obviously a tremendous leader, one of the best players in the program history. It's really sad. I mean, I, the State, this is just, I'll give you an idea. State had 28 more offensive plays than Duke, possessed the ball for nearly 14 more minutes, and only managed three points. So the fact that he's having to, and I admire him, I know he's a true leader and is going up there and is taking the bullets for everybody. I mean, he's the last person on this roster who needs to be apologizing. And again, the defense, we sit there and and we talk about it every week. And you and I talk about this a lot, all fair, is how hard it is to play defense in, in at any level of competitive football right now, especially the higher you go up, whether it's FBS, FCS, all the way to the NFL. Uh, they are playing well enough to win big plays aside. It is just, again, if you're being objective, how much pressure is on them every single week? I mean, especially when the competition ratchets up, when you know you're playing Duke, who has a good defense, and you know NC State's offense is average at best before this, and I would I would say now, going against the level of competition they're going to face, it is going to be a struggle. Unless something drastically changes over the final five games for them to generate any type of consistent offense, I, I just – we can bang on the coaching all we want, and sure, that deserves blame. But I, they are so limited at receiver and offensive line. It is it is really eye popping, especially like I said, when you start playing better opponents. And Duke is a very good football team. They're well coached. They're a veteran team. Yeah. They don't beat themselves. Uh, I, I can't say enough about them. I was wrong. I thought State had a chance to win this game. And again, Corey, I said this at the beginning. Of the podcast, ten out of ten times they beat State. Yeah. If Riley Leonard's playing, this game's probably 45-3, to three, if we're being 100% honest. Yeah, I mean, the one thing I'll add here, uh, Randy pointed out, I, I completely forgot that the, the first one was a pass interference uh, by Shaheen Battle. Um, it wasn't – for some reason, I was thinking it was Jordan Waters that ran that football out of there, but it was – Henry Beelan was the one uh, late in the game where they had it fourth and – or they had it uh, first and, like – 17 from their own goal line essentially um and then the first one was actually a pass interference which i thought was uncatchable the issue uh at hand there is the fact that shaheen battle made it so obvious that he ran into uh, a a wide receiver uh in open space (laughs) that you know it it almost has to be called at that point oh yeah yeah there's no question i mean that was um, uh, the corner play has not i would say if we're going to be critical of the defense the secondary play has has been has been that was supposed suspect. to be the suspect, the that suspect. Was to be the suspect. And, I, and i i'm sure shaheen bow i might be the first to tell you they have not played particularly well but at the same time i go back to how much pressure is on them what are you trying to do defensively if you're nc state generate turnovers because that's really if you get the ball in the defensive back or linebacker's hands, whether it's a fumble return, interception return, whatever it is, the hope is you can get lucky and score on the play. You're just pressing. Again, we see it. They see it every day in practice on top of game day. They know what they're up against. You're, you're, you're fighting the opponent, and you're, you're also playing against your, the opponent as well as your own offense at this point. And I say that because if you take out – the VMI game and the Marshall game, uh, you just it, – it's obvious how bad State is offensively. Um, and that's not taking anything away from Duke. I do think Duke's probably one of the best defensive teams in the country. But there's no excuse for NC State to go into a game like this and only manage three points. It's it's just – it's embarrassing. Um, it should, shouldn't happen. And here you are, like you said, 
this is only year two for Mike Elko. I mean, God, talk about a guy who's done a hell of a job. He came in, he won nine games in year one. What does he do? He aggressively ta- attacks the portal, and states had their success in the portal, Corey. But I would argue for teams like NC State, Duke, teams that are not those blue bloods, it just further signifies the importance of state. Now, I'm not saying go all in on the portal, but they need to bring in 10 transfers in the offseason. There's no way around yeah. it. You need two or three receivers, two or three offensive linemen. I mean, you got to bring in a quarterback to, to be MJ's perspective backup. There's just a lot that they need to do. And I don't know how they're going to make it numbers wise, but I yeah. think that coming out of this game is the biggest story. And I say that because regardless of how things go the rest of the season, it's not going to change my opinion. I just don't think NC State is good enough going forward on offense at basically every position um, to be satisfied or just continue the status quo. I mean, you have got to – all your NIL resources have got to be put into the offensive line and the receiver room. I mean, I, that's – it. You know, I don't know what else to say. I mean, that's yeah. there's the only way that you could be optimistic about 2024. You can't keep bringing back the same guys and thinking things are going to get better. Yeah, well – and, and one of the major reasons I know there's a lot of reasons why Duke has been successful, obviously, you know, as we said, Riley Leonard, I mean, you know, up until last year, nobody knew who Riley Leonard was. He was a basketball prospect before he ever went there. And, and he's became, you know, one of the better quarterbacks in, in the entire country, a potential first round potential, you know, at the very least day two pick in the NFL draft, probably next year. That's how good he is. But you know, the reason why this team is as good as it's been is because when Mike Elko came in, he said, all right, we need to hit a reset. We need to go. We need to go through, figure out what the strengths of this team are, what the weaknesses are. And he went through and said, we're going to go out and find players, whether it was his former players or whether it was guys that he had been recruiting, bring them in. And he was able to, you know, structure a team that was good enough to be able to compete in the ACC last year and push to, you know, <laughs> we're, I mean, we're talking about, you know, a team that is right now undefeated in the ACC is going into the next three weeks or next three of their four weeks against teams that are undefeated in the ACC and competing for ACC championships in year two. And that's, that's in major part because he said, look, what's happening right now is not working. NC State needs to take a look in the mirror and say, what's happening right now is not working. And Peyton Wilson's not going to be walking through that door next year. He's out of eligibility. Several guys are not going to be back next year, some for good, some for uh, worse. And that's that's the thing right now is that you have to – I know there's still five games left. There's a chance to build and, and try to get the players that are going to be here for the future better. And then <laughs> looking, at, looking at the future and going, all right, what do we need because that we will not have on the roster next year? Yeah, and I think we talk about the hard reset. I think the if you take a big step back, it is this is not taking anything away from Mike Elko because he's done a tremendous job. The longer you're at a program, the harder a hard reset is, if that makes sense. Dave Dorn will be next year will be year 12. You've built up this loyalty, this program where you've developed guys on and off the field. You obviously do it the right way. We can't say anything about Dave Dorn there, but you have got to have hard conversations with players. You're going to have countless players on this roster who will be in year three, year four, and cannot compete for a spot on the two deep. And if they are on the two deep court, quite mm-hmm. frankly, they're not good enough. Um, so I don't know. It is going to be, I would argue, regardless of how this goes the rest of the way, it will be one of the most challenging off season of Dave Dorn's career because you've got so many issues at key positions and how can you get it to 85, the magic number, and really improve this roster? You need a lot of attrition. That's clear. Your receiver room, a complete overhaul. Offensive line, I would argue, complete overhaul, regardless of how all this stuff goes. The challenging part is how do you make that, not to get too far in the weeds, how do you make it work numbers-wise? And it, you're not going to run kids off, per se, but you can't continue with this the way things are. I don't think it is a great thing. You know, all these you know people across the country programs are, you know, not necessarily NC State, poke chest out. We only had X amount of transfers. I'm going to be really honest, Corey. I think it would be good for NC State if 15, 20 kids left the program. I think it 
for not only NC State, but for them. If they can find a oh. better, I think they both sides would be a win-win. I know that's crazy, and I know that may rub fans the wrong way, but I really believe that there needs to be those hard conversations, and there needs to be a lot of attrition, a lot of attrition. I think it's the right thing for both um the team and the actual players yeah and i mean the one thing i will the one thing i'll add to all of this as well is you know <laughs> we keep talking about you know the, the teams that that they're losing to and um you know uh, you you lost to marcus freeman granted notre dame is notre dame and they just throttled usc yeah and but that's a second year head coach mm -hmm. you lost to Jeff Brom, first-year head coach at a new program. Obviously, he's been a head coach at Purdue for several years. But coming into a program and, and having to, once again, hit reset there a little bit, bring in his guys, bring in guys that, you know, uh, that had relationships with, with other coaches as well. And, yes, I mean, Mark brings up a good point here. He said, we just went through a reset in 2019. Yeah, and you saw what that led to. You see what that led to in 2020, 2021. Obviously, the, the chance that the hope was to be building towards 2022 and it, it came, it fell disastrously short, whether it was the offensive uh, issue. You're a year to right. year in college yeah. football right now, especially if you're a non blue blood program. If you want to consistently compete, you can't operate. Well, we're just going to get these high school kids and we're going to develop them. I know that I personally hate the current model where things are standing. I know you're not. I mean, it's just the transfer portal is a is the wild, wild west. It is not what it's supposed to be. There's no guardrails. We're past all that. I just – for NC State to be competitive and continue to be, you know, relevant, I, every year I'm not saying you have to have a hard reset. But mm -hmm. if guys aren't performing, they're going to have to go. It's like a job. Now, <laughs> I mean, you know, you got to go. You got to get out. You cannot have guys. They've got so many on this roster. I'm not going to name them because I genuinely think a lot of these kids, three, four, five years, and you're not competing for a spot on the two deep. And if you are on the two deep, you're not very good. Um, I think that is is where things are. So I don't think a successful offseason should be one of the measuring sticks, which has been for programs across the country. It's, well, we only had X amount transfer out. Yeah, that you that needs to be thrown out the window. That is a it dumb thing. And here's the thing, and I think I think people are starting to accept that on you know the basketball side of things because you're seeing okay, you're able to bring in you know NC State brought in you know seven transfers this past year on the basketball side of things, and they're going all right. You know, there's there's a bunch of kids that are coming into this program that are wanting to have you know, a better career than what they were doing previously. They, they wanted to come to NC State because they have a chance to to compete for minutes. They want it. And that's the issue that you're running into right now is a lot of these guys have been here and said, all right, it, it just seems like you're just you're, you're happy with your role where it is. Um, and I'll, I will add this, too. I wanted to, to t throw this up here. Um, uh, Matthew brought up a good point. He said it's not who we lost to. It's how we lost. He's 100% right. Yeah, it's how we lost because – you know, you, you look at the, the Notre Dame game and that game was winnable all the way up until the all the way up until the fourth quarter where you throw two as two Louisville was as well. interceptions. Louisville was winnable as well. And you lose that one 13 to 10 because you just never got your offense going. And, well, I, and, yeah, and yeah. now you're looking at this game, a 24 to three loss where. You know, this one was probably the one where you're like, all right, I don't I don't have any answers and, as to how NC State would have won this game because neither side of the ball really held up there into the bargain. Well, I think, like you said, we, we've beaten a dead horse. The reoccurring, th re reoccurring theme is the lack of firepower offensively, yeah. and it is proven time and time again. And I'm just – I'm sitting here scribbling some notes down a minute ago. Okay, if you go into this offseason knowing what we know now, I don't, ex I don't expect a ton of changes in the next five games. I'm not talk speaking for you, but I'm assuming you probably feel the same way. You've got to bring in a backup quarterback. You've got to at least bring in two receivers. That puts you at three, at least two or three offensive linemen. That puts you at, what, five, six players. Defensively, you're probably going to lose. You know you're losing Peyton Wilson. You know you're losing Jalen Scott. There's two more. I mean, Corey, you pick your eyes, and out of just necessity, you're at seven, eight, nine, ten guys. So yeah, I, I think that number, honestly, 
going to be 10 to 12 at least. I, I think you've got to have a lot of attrition. And I would argue that NC State probably needs 15 players from the portal. And I know that sounds crazy, but I just – I think they're really in a tough spot right now because it's not only how you're playing and the obvious – you know, weaknesses or receiver offensive line. It also goes to, well, where are we losing multiple players at who are, you know, productive? You got linebacker, possibly cornerback. I mean, I would argue, though, that Aiden White and Shane Battle both need to come back next year. Now, there's no uh, way you could probably justify either one of those guys leaving unless they start playing significantly better. So maybe that's a bright spot. But just off the sheer attrition from graduation and whatnot, on top of where you need to get better, I mean, it, I I can't envision a situation where they don't bring in double-digit transfers. I know that sounds – but if they're going to be competitive next year, because I'm going to tell you what, don't think Mike Elko is going to be satisfied or Mac Brown or whoever. I mean, yeah. that's the name of the game right now. Unless you're recruiting and landing four and five-star guys every year and that's not going to be NC State, it's not going to be 99% of college football. I think there's going to be a trend where you're just going to have to say, all right, guys, every year we're bringing in 10 plus guys. And mm -hmm. you're hopeful that you hit on three fourths of them. Half of them is probably more realistic. NC State, to its credit, has been very successful. The hit rate has been good, but that you can't, I, I don't, I don't, I don't understand or envision how they can't going forward not bring in double digit transfers every year the way everything is constructed. Yeah. And I'll, I'll throw this up here too. Uh, <laughs> one of our uh, listeners said, uh, if we had an average offense, this team could be six and zero right now. Defense Can't argue. out by the third quarter after so many four and outs, but it's really a bunch of them three and outs. I mean, yeah, it's uh, you know, and, and that's true. That's true because yep. the, the games that you've lost so far, um, you know, this game right here, you know, one of those, again, <laughs> a, a, a turnover that led to, uh, you know, the the defense being able to bring it back to the eight-yard line. That's one of your touchdowns out of three that the defense gave up. Um, so this this defense is, is, is doing its job overall. Again, I said the frustration I have is the fact they continue to give up explosive plays. But I also agree. This defense is pressing. They're frustrated. Uh, there's there's only so much you can do. You can't force turnovers every single game. You can't have pick sixes every single game. You, you know, you're, you're, they're they're doing everything they possibly can to you know put this offense in good position. And and there's, well, there's just not it's not putting it all together. Um, the 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 one thing I will add here, uh, you get a chance to get a have a bye week. I mean, I know I keep saying this, but like. You feel like the move here is to say, all right, you know, Trent Penix, I know we just talked about the fact that he had a big game last week. He has another injury tonight. Do you start looking oh at – Oh, my gosh. I'm Devontae, so tired Devontae of hearing Devontae about Marine, you know. Devontae Marine becomes maybe a bigger part of this offense. You know, guys like – I know Bradley Rosner has, it was came in to be a big part of this offense. Three catches, not, 33 yes. yards, and had, had two drop passes tonight. Um, you know, He's not the answer. And I yeah, so I, I start looking at, at what you have moving forward, and that's that's got to be the move going into this I week. You thoroughly, can't hit, you can't hit a full hard reset. You can't just you know go out and go get ten day contracts. But you've got to do something. Yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed covering Trent, but I mean, he blesses. He's hurt all the time, and I think. My just two cents would be what you do going forward at all these positions, Rosner, Penix, whoever, they need to be split 50-50 at best. You, I mean, you know what you have there. And although Trent is great and can give you these big plays, I mean, he just can't stay healthy. And there's a number of guys. I just think at best you split at 50-50 young old. Uh, there's no reason and there's nothing – you can't justify continuing to play a Keanu saying leading the team in snaps offensive receiver. It's just, you can't justify that. And that's not a shot at Keon. He has just simply not produced. He's in his fifth year. He can't consistently create separation in his defense. He's playing out of position, probably should be playing slot receiver. I, I just, there's too much talent at the slot. There, yeah. I mean, he's, you, you can't keep giving, 
you know, forcing the ball to these players and trying to expect them to have these huge roles. I mean, how much longer are we going to continue to do that? And yeah. how many people are going to say, well, this guy needs to be more If they've been there three, four, five years and they're not a significant part of the offense, they don't need to be a significant part of the offense going forward. I, I can't say it any clearer. I don't know in this situation what else to – I mean, how do you feel? I mean, what do you think? I, I don't know. No, I mean, I agree with you. And and here's the thing is the thing that we've used to justify that, and we posted it on the board this past week, was, hey, Keon Lassane's getting a lot of snaps, but over 40% of his snaps are on run plays. Well, you're not doing anything running the ball either. So you got to be able to spread the football around. you got to be able to get these deep downfield passes. And yeah, you're still not- catches for 25 yards. I mean, how, yeah. I mean and that's not – not and that's because, of, that's because of one of those being a 15 yard reception. Most Bradley of Rosner, five targets. I mean, that's yeah. 12 targets between those two. I mean, not the single guys out, but like, yeah, that's and again, five. Those are the, again, those are guys that probably aren't going to make a big impact moving forward. Guys like, you know, Terrell Timmons that I thought had a good game the last couple games. Uh, only two, you know, well, let me see, five total targets for him. I know he dropped, not dropped one, but did have one that was, uh, you know, probably needed to be a little more physical, make the catch. Um, and then, you know, again. He's Kevin, losing targets to those guys, though, Corey. Yeah. Nine for 58 between Rosner and Lassane. The numbers are what they are at this point. I, I don't understand. And, and I would argue Kevin Conception, as many he had what? 10 targets, he is still losing targets to older players who consistently continue to not perform. So why are the, is he losing targets? Why is Terrell Timmons, who has a significantly higher season ceiling than both those players, why is he losing targets? We yeah. talk about the receiver rotation being cut down. I'm convinced at this point that's probably not going to happen. That's just how Robert and I rolls. We're going to have to deal with it, but I'm going to tell you, man, if they don't start producing on offense, it's going to get really uncomfortable. It's already uncomfortable. He's going to have a lot of hard questions to answer at his media availability this week, assuming he talks to the media. I just – the fact that those two guys, and, again, this is nothing against them, are taking nine targets away from other players at this point when you're only scoring three points in a game is – it's inexcusable. There's no reason for that to be happening. I mean, Kevin Conception, as far as I'm concerned, targeted him 20 times a game at this point. I think what you're running into with him, Corey, though, is as the competition ramps up, everybody's going to double and triple team him. You take mm-hmm. Kevin Conception away, there's nobody on this roster has proven that they are a you know, consistent uh, receiver at this level. And it is just – it's tough. I just – I don't envy the situation they're in. But at the same time, I just – for the life of me, cannot understand why we, you know, NC State can't cut this thing down uh, rotation-wise. Yeah, and, and Matthew brought up a, a good question here. He said our wide receivers can't seem to get open, can't catch, and can't block. Why can't we just take out wide receivers and add more blockers to improve the running game? I mean, mm-hmm. the issue is you there. it's not proven that you can do that either. I mean, they mm-hmm. put multiple tight ends out there. They put – hell, they had Lennon Cooper – uh, no, not Lennon Cooper. Um, Jacarius P. Jacarius P. Literally wear a different jersey number against UConn, a team that doesn't and look tonight. Really good. And tonight. And tonight, wearing a different jersey number to put him out there as a tight end so that you can have him line up as a tight end. And it's still not working to be able to get the running game going. So I don't know. Look, I, I'm not an offensive coordinator. I don't know exactly what the issue is here, but it needs to be fixed. And that's that's the issue that you're running into right now is the fact that we, you know, we're saying each and every week, well, they're not running the ball enough because of the fact that, you know, they're down or they're not uh, running the ball well enough because the offensive line isn't getting uh, enough play. You look back at last week, you know what ended up leading to the offense finally getting going in terms of the running game? The fact that they were able to find a deep downfield passing game. Uh, and you know, and here's the thing too: is you beat a you beat a Marshall team and you felt pretty good about it, 48 to 41. Well, guess what? They just got smacked around by Georgia State this past week. You and they're not a Power Five, five team. I mean, yeah, you, you and, well, and I'll just say this: like I'm I'm looking at you know, granted, I know the you know <laughs> that that rule doesn't always work, but you beat a UConn team in week one, and we talked about, hey, this is probably a pretty good UConn team. Well, that, that UConn team is not very good, and you barely beat them. Uh, the the Louisville team that you beat 13 to 10, yes, they just beat 
uh, Notre Dame last week and everybody felt really good about them. Well, guess what? They just got smacked by a pit team. That's not very good. So there's the, all of these teams were flawed and you had a chance to potentially beat uh, some of these teams and you had a chance to probably, you know, make a statement against some of these other teams. And they just haven't been able to do that because of the fact that the offense is just not there. So mm -hmm. I agree. And I, I was on, on record saying I, I thought Marshall was a good football team. I still, no, I, I still think they're a good team. Yeah. I mean, Georgia State is a very good team too, by the way. But so. you don't, if you're NC State, this is not a shot at Marshall. You don't measure yourself as a Power 5 ACC football program against Marshall. You don't. Yeah. What you start measuring yourself as a rival who's right down the road, who's as a coach in his second year, and I would argue they are a legitimate 100% top 15 team. Like Duke's going to be a tough out. They're great on defense. They get the quarterback back. I mean, you even look, we're talking about receivers. We're talking about skill as a court. They got good receivers, really good receivers at Duke. Yep. And it seems like every week NC State's playing teams that have receivers. And I think that further signals the trouble they have in the receiver room. I mean, even Marshall had guys who could separate. And again, like people are saying, not just us, guys just can't get open. It's, it's so clear. NC State can't block and guys can't get open. And when they're open, outside Kevin Conception, they can't consistently catch the football. It's really – we can talk on this podcast for 10 hours, but it's really down to blocking, creating separation, getting open, running backs, making plays. They just – it's three or four bullet points on what NC State can't do that are in, in, inhibiting them from becoming a good football team. And I don't think the answers are currently on the roster, which is very concerning, like I said. The difficulty, like we're sitting here talking, is to do a hard reset, which, again, I don't care what happens the rest of the way. You can't convince me there's not a hard reset offensively, like personnel-wise. Like, there's going to be a lot of pressure on Dave Dorn in the offseason to mm -hmm. get it fixed. So, it's just really hard in going to – he'll be in year 12 next year to do that. You almost have to change your philosophy, and I think he's not alone. All head coaches – as much as you love your players and you recruit these guys and you want to be loyal and all this, guys are getting paid now. you got to produce. And I know yeah. that may rub some people, some of our subscribers, some NC State fans the wrong way. If you're not producing, you're going to have to go. And that's just – I mean, that's the way it is in every other uh, line of, uh, I say, work, every other job. And, and at it's this point, being a Division One athlete at a Power 5 school is a job. You are getting paid now. Most of them are. Yep. Although a lot of them are not getting rich. So they are getting paid. Uh, I think you're going to be in a, a really tough spot where they're going to have to start being treated that way. Yeah. And I'll, I'll put this up there. And, and this is basically passes along my thoughts here. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> said, you know, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this. This is Ebonic Mazer. I think I, I don't know exactly what the real name is here, but uh, it says we can't place all the faults on RA, meaning Robert and I. This seems inconsistencies in the offense stretch back to last year. And I would say I would even say stretch back to you know years prior. Oh, yeah. I know we talked about you know Devin Leary and and how great he was back in 2021, but there was a lot of times where the offense did absolutely nothing, and then Devin Leary bailed them out with a, a strong pass on third down, or, or Emeka Mezzi made a big catch and and changed the way the offense was looked at. This offense has not been humming on all cylinders for years now. Yeah, and Robert and I didn't forget how to coach football. I mean, to say he's not a good football coach would just be inaccurate. It's not, there's no factual information to suggest that. Yeah, He's had success everywhere he's been. I think the issue right now, and again, I said this at the beginning of the podcast, you just don't have the horses. You don't have the horsepower on offense right now. I don't think it matters who is coaching NC State offensively. I know a lot of people didn't like Tim Beck, but looking back now, there's just not enough there. There's not, and there's still not enough there. So again, going forward, whatever your NIL pool is, it needs to go to skill players and you need to try to find some offensive linemen at, who at worst can, can, you know, compete for a spot on the two D. But I, I would argue that the lion's share of NC state's money NIL wise, and it feels weird to even still be talking about this. You essentially have to go out and buy receivers. They've got to do it uh, because if they don't do it, you're not – it's not going to get better. I mean, the, the answers right now outside Kevin Conception, maybe Terrell Timmons, and I think Javante Vereen is eventually going to be a really good player. There's nothing else there but that I can say concrete 
well, well he's going to really be a factor. He's going to emerge. And it doesn't matter who the coach is, what the play calling is, play design. We can talk about that for hours, days, whatever. It's just not. It's not it. And and if anybody else who covers NC State is telling you anything different, they're so that's all I can do. And uh, you know, if there's if there's any more uh, proof, and that, look, obviously this is at the highest level of the ACC right now. Uh, not saying that NC State is going to go out and be Florida State and go out and just you know buy a guy like you know or, or go out and be able to bring in a guy like Johnny Wilson or a guy like Keon Coleman that have just been. You know, the the reason for this team's success, I know Jordan Travis has been, you know, heralded as a, as a great quarterback. And, yes, I think he's he's progressed significantly as a player. Uh -huh. One of the reasons why they've been able to be successful is the fact that they've done that. One of the reasons why Clemson has struggled to find success over the last several years is because they continue to try to do the exact same things. If you – I mean, that is literally <laughs> the definition of insanity – is trying to do the same things over and over and over again and expecting a different result. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. And I, I think the last thing I would say is if you're NC State, the offseason, your sales pitch is first, you have to be competitive in your NIL package. It has to be competitive. It has to be in the ball. It has to be in the ballpark. But if you can couple that with the opportunity that you would obviously have, if you are a talented receiver, there's no question you can come to NC State next year and make a huge impact. But again, it goes hand in hand. And we keep talking know, again, some fans have yet to come around to this. It comes down to NIL. And I think you can combine it with the opportunity that, we, that you have. If you can make those things mesh together, which you should be able to, in my opinion, then you're going to have success. I think NC State would be a very attractive destination for guys. You can't go to the NFL without film. So if you're stuck somewhere and you're a four or five star high school receiver and you're a, you're not getting where you need to go, you can come to NC State next year. But again, all this is moot, Corey, unless they're competitive wise. We can sit here and talk about and people are gonna blame Joker Phillips. Why can't we land this guy? That is so out of touch right now. Joker Phillips can do whatever he can promise you, talk to you, call you every single day. NIL is it. And then the opportunity, I think, if you combine that, will make NC State attractive. But and there's a lot of people working really hard, you know, wise behind the scenes. They deserve a ton of credit. The collectives have done a great job. I think what you have got to do is just going forward how you allocate those funds. Receiver needs to be at the top of the list every single year. It has to be. Um, it's just you got to have them. And NC State has struggled mightily to, to consistently have guys who can make those chunk plays, can go 80 yards, one, you know, yeah. one play drives. That's really the difference to me, the receiver play at the end of the day, because if you have guys like that, Corey, it will take a lot of pressure off the run game. Yeah, And I think we would see the run game do a complete 180 almost if you had two, three guys who were uh, legitimate, you know, receivers. Yeah. That's and, it. you know, at the same time, I brought up those two programs. Louisville, a team that we just talked about, first year under Jeff Brom, obviously. He has some past of, of developing wide receivers, but Jamari Thrash, a guy that came into a Louisville program that, you know, under a first-year head coach there, uh, a team that, you know, had had success but not great success. And I know, obviously, you know, they have a, a, probably a great NIL package given the money that yeah, flows and I the think, program. Uh, yeah. but, here, but that's the thing is – you the, also the sold an opportunity here on top of the NIL was the fact that the opportunity to do what he's doing now. That's yeah. what you're selling right now is, Hey, look outside of Kevin Concepcion right now, like there's just not a ton there. There's no, there's not, a, yes. You, you bring in Jonathan Paylor next year. Yes. You bring in guys like, you know, Christian Zachary, some others that you feel good about Jamar Boston potentially, but I mean, you, you, you need to be going to mid-major programs and FCS, wherever you want to, um, group of fives, and guys who are a thousand plus yard receivers. You need to reach out to every single one of them, and you throw as much as you can at each, and you put together, even if it's the same package for all of them. You swing and you say, "All right, let's land as many of these guys as we can." Mm -hmm. And again, I, I I know that sounds like I'm making it eat. I really think that you don't overanalyze it. I think you put together a wide receiver package 
and you go after guys who you think you can legitimately get. Who are guys that want to play on a bigger stage? Obviously, you're going to have to compete against some powerhouse programs. But at the end of the day, if a guy is looking for a one-year rental type deal to try to get to the NFL, NC State's a really talented, a really good, um, I think, program. Especially, I, I still think MJ is going to be really good. I do. I just don't think he is in a spot in his career. I, I don't. I don't know how you feel, but I don't know who you put a quarterback would make this offense any better with what he's got offensive line wise and receiver. So yeah. uh, for those who are criticizing him and, you know, Brendan Armstrong played poorly, but looking back on it now, it doesn't matter who's playing quarterback when you've got the issues they have right now offensively. Yeah. And I mean, I think that was only amplified even more tonight because I know that the numbers probably won't bear out that there was five to seven drops tonight. But you look at, I mean, you look at some of the some of the catches that could have been made. That's yeah. that's what I'm going by here is is if you have a receiver that makes a physical grab, if you have yeah. a receiver like that's that's what NC State was known for. That's what NC State that's what led to some of the more successful teams was having a guy like Emeka Mezzi go up and make a physical catch, having a guy like Kelvin Harmon go up and make a physical catch. I mean, right now Kevin Concepcion has made some physical catches. But you don't have any guy that that can that can out physical a DB. They're not creating separation, so you don't you don't have anything. Yeah, it, yeah you're exactly right. It's twofold: the physical catch and the routine catch. Mm-hmm. But the the lack of separation. You, you just can't. They're guys who can't get open, and there's no big play potential outside conception. We can yeah. say that now. There's enough data. We have watched enough games. I mean, my God, over the past three years, we've watched enough games to where we can say there's not enough, there's, you know, conception is it right now who can consistently get up and consistently produce. And that is a major problem. If you cannot create separation, you can't generate big plays. If you can't generate big plays, you're not going to compete for ACC championships. You're going to continue to be, you know, at best, probably your defense can be as great, can be great. We saw what that got state last year, got you eight wins. You're going to be in that seven, eight, win neighborhood forever until you get difference makers on the outside. You can't just say, we're going to be this run team. We're going to uh, do all that. That's irrelevant. unless you have got guys who can make plays on the outside. Yeah. And as much as we've talked about, you know, the fact that these last five games are going to be difficult games for NC state. I mean, three of the games are against opponents that haven't really proven that they can do a ton offensively. I mean, outside of Miami, and UNC, three of those programs haven't done a ton offensively. So the defense can potentially win you a game if you're able to do enough offensively. And that's the that's the thing that has to be figured out. I don't think you're going to be able to figure it out entirely, but you've got to figure out ways to be able to at least have some sustainable success, whether it's cutting down on penalties, whether it's making contested catches, whether it's you know just being able to find ways to get guys in space and get things moving because – Three of those games at home and two of them are against actual difficult offenses. I mean, you know, and look, I'm not saying I'm like not to push down Clemson here, but Clemson at the same time. Oh, yeah, they struggled offensively. They just eked out a game this past week against a Wake Forest team that does not have a very good defense by scoring 17 points and figuring out a way to get win that game. So that there these are all, you know, three of those games from a defensive standpoint are winnable games. And we know what NC State's done against UNC in the past. We know NC State's been able to find ways to limit what Miami does in the past. you got to be able to put it all together to be able to win these games. And that's that, to me, I think is what needs to happen over these last five games in order for them to, to try to figure out some way to get to, you know, a, a, I mean, I know it's not, the, it's not the expectations that you have before the season, but you find a way to go three and two over these next five games. You get to a seven and five record. That's at least getting expectations you change. Yes. And getting you to a point where you can progress with these younger players, getting you to a point where going into next season, you have a you have a baseline of what you have and what you need. You don't even know truly what you have right now because you're just not able to put it all together. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I think you're right. And again, I think that at the end of the day, the biggest challenge for NC State going forward will be how do you manage the snaps offensively? You know what you have offensive line-wise. You only got five or six guys who are ready to play right now. That is not great, but that's where you are. At the receiver position, it's a lot less physically demanding. I think at this point, 
what Dave Dorn is going to face a major challenge, whether he's talking to Joker Phillips, Robert or not, whoever he's speaking to in the next couple of weeks, what you have now, it is a reached a fever pitch. The older guys are not good enough. If you keep putting them out there, you're going to keep getting the same result. It's happened for two, three years now. So that to me is the biggest storyline of the bye week. What happens at receiver? Do we know? We know Kevin Conception's good. Do we know? For all we know, none of the younger receivers can play. But guess what? We don't know that yet. So you know I mean, what you have at the older receiver, and it's not good enough. It is not good enough to play FCS football, if I'm being honest. Well, and that's the thing. Last last thing I'll say here, and I'm going to shut up. And yeah, then you get I'm on. the it's answer. Already, you. It's already 120. I've got, a, I've got an almost hour-long drive home. Yeah. The last thing I'll say. I mentioned him earlier, Javante Vereen. I understand somehow or another got in the doghouse earlier this season. I'm watching him pregame. He's pumped. He's excited. Gets out there, zero receptions in the game. I don't even didn't even get a target in the game. Michael Allen, we've talked so much about got his, 43 about carries his in seven games. About, about his potential. 43 carries. Four, well, five, five carries tonight, 21 yards. He's averaging over four yards per carry. Like you're so you mean to tell me that with an offense that overall gained just over 300 total yards that you couldn't have benefited from him potentially, you know, continuing to get you, you know, four to five yards per carry and every once in a while get you a gashing play. Guy yeah. like, you know, obviously Kendrick Raphael I know is still not fully healthy. Hopefully we'll see him get fully healthy going into, uh, you know, two yeah. weeks from now. And then do you see a move to those guys? I just – that to me, I know I keep saying it, but that needs to be the move. You can't we, – we we can talk about hard reset all we want. That's yep. not going to happen right now. you got to do something to be able to put the focus on these younger players and figure out what you have. Yeah, and I think the last thing I'll say is that to me, and I'm not in the room and I'm not assuming, but it feels like from the outside, are you focusing – more on what these younger players are not good at and what they can't do as opposed to, well, they clearly, their ceiling, I mean, anybody, you don't have to know anything about football to, to figure out Javante Vereen's ceiling is higher than 95% of the receivers on state's roster. Yeah. Michael Allen is far and away right now, you know, him and Kenny Raphael are the most talented run backs on. It's not close. So, is are they not playing because they don't they're not blocking whatever they're not doing i think you got to push some of that aside and say look we're gonna have to just throw these guys in the fire if it's pass blocking if it's certain things they're just gonna have to learn playing and we're gonna have to move on because you are at such a disadvantage by playing some of these older guys right now and they're not going to get better like that's where i'm at so you can say, well, there these youngers aren't ready to play. Well, guess what? The older guys aren't giving you anything right now. So, and they haven't given you anything for all year. So why does this continue to be? I think that is the frustration when you cover this team like we do. And I'm sure the fan base is at wit's end. So again, as much as we think of these guys as people, it is a product-based business and they're not producing. That's it. Yeah, Juice Vereen on the season, four receptions for 65 yards, every single one of them coming against Notre Dame. The that he was going to face. Yep. So um, just that's nice. you. you got to swallow your pride or whatever, adjust your philosophy and say, look, for all the miscomings, misgivings, whatever, this kid is young, he's not ready, blah, blah, blah. Well, guess what? You need to play the most talented players at this point, regardless of their age and the guys who give you the most upside, because offensively right now, you're so severely limited, you've got to have as many people on that field as possible who are a threat to make big plays. That's that's where it is for NC State. Exactly. Well, I think that'll just about wrap up this podcast. Uh, we went over an hour somehow talking about whatever we just watched out there on the football field. Uh, but we will, we will have much more – uh, from from you know talking about the next five games, talking about you know Clemson, which you know the one thing the one thing I will take away from this one as well is you know despite not having a <laughs> a, a starting quarterback that you felt good about, yeah, I'm so, you know this this defense this Duke team was able to take two weeks and focus on NC State. That's what NC State needs to do: take these next two weeks, focus on Clemson, mm -hmm. find a way to put a game plan together that's able to win that game. 
And we, um, we're we talking about that win as opposed to talking about everything else that has happened previously. And then you're able to kind of hit, you know, maybe hit reset for them uh, personally in that locker room and, and look forward to the next four games and figure out what worked there, what's going forward. Um, and, and that's that's really all I can, I can take away from that. Um, thank you to everybody for listening. Uh, I appreciate everybody. I know we got a ton of comments on here. I was only able to put a few of them up, but – um, Thanks for everybody we'll joining us. Things. We appreciate your support, guys. We really do. It means a lot to Corey and I. Yes, sir. Well, Michael, I appreciate you jumping on. I'm going to let you roll so you can go get some sleep, man. No, nah, I'm going to go back to work here in a second. Um, <laughs> that's just how it goes, but we're, we're glad to do it. Appreciate everybody's support, man. Enjoy it. We'll talk soon. Yes, sir. Well, again, thank you to everybody for listening. We will talk to you again soon.